Hello, welcome to Veteran Voice. I'm Larry McCullough, I'll be your host today. My guests today are three World War II veterans who have taken their time to come out and visit with us today, and we're going to talk about the new World War II memorial that uh, has recently been finished in downtown Paducah, Kentucky, and, and uh, we've got some of the men here who had something to do with it, and some of them are here just to share their stories and talk about how proud they are to have, uh, have this monument built here in Paducah. Uh, on my left is uh, Leon Dodge, probably a familiar face. Uh, Leon's been active in the community for a long time and was the uh, fire chief for several years. Uh, Leon, thanks for, for coming out. Uh, Alan Rhodes, I know a lot of people I'm sure know Mr. Rhodes from his extensive business that he's been doing here in Paducah. And, uh, Alan, uh, welcome to the program. Thank you for coming out today. And then on, on my right here is, is uh, Russ Chitton. And Russ, uh, you work with the Good Old Boys Barbecue team. And, you're a World War II veteran too, and uh, you did some fundraising to help uh, help us get the World War II monument built. And I'm glad that all three of you could take a little time to come out and talk to us today. Uh, let's start by just getting a little bit of background, knowing that all all three of you are World War II veterans. If you could just give me a little short synopsis of when you went in the military and uh, and where you went to when you were stationed overseas, and uh, you know just a little bit of background on your military experience. So Leon, when we start with you. I went in when I was 19 years old. I took my basic training in Texas. Uh, went to England, stayed in England five months before the invasion of France. Uh, the invasion was June the 6th. I went in June the 13th on my 21st birthday. I had a good birthday present. And I went all the way through. I was in four major battles. And went to the Elbe River and waited for the Russians to take Berlin. We were 13 miles from Berlin. Could have, we waited there two weeks for them. We could already had Berlin, but waited for the Russians to take it. Patton wanted to go in and take it. Politics being what they were, they yeah. Held you up where you were then, huh? Held us up where we were on the Elk River. Hmm. I guess politics get involved in every war from oh, yeah. all the way through, I suppose. Yeah. Um, Alan, tell us tell us about, uh, about your going in the military and what you did. Well, um, <clears throat> I went in in uh, 43, and I, for till January the 1st of 43 until 46. So I was three and a half years during the war. Then I was recalled for the Korean War. And I spent a year and a half that time. Ooh. Fortunately, uh, or I did not go overseas during World War II. I gave basic training over and over and over. I gave 10 or 12 cycles of basic training and you'd graduate the troops and they'd go overseas. And then, uh, but during the Korean War, I was lucky. I didn't go to Korea and I didn't want to go to Korea. It was a muddy place and a cold place. I went to Germany and that was pretty easy duty. It was one of the best times of my life, really. Good, but uh, so you were the fellow in the basic training that, uh, as I understand, company commander, your job was to train the troops going over into the battle in World War II, and, and they relied on you to teach them the best chance they would have to survive over there. That's true. Well, every, everybody does their own position, and that's, a, that's an important one, too. Russ, tell us, uh, tell us a little bit about your uh, stint in the, in the military. Well, I'll try to tell the truth all the way through. I'm okay. sure about these other guys. I was only 18. I wasn't eligible for the draft when something happened, an atomic bomb, I mean, a bomb was dropped on New York, and I tried to join the Army then the day after Pearl Harbor, but I went in as a volunteer in the draft in January of 1942, and I got out in February of 1946. I spent two and a half years in the Pacific, some beautiful southern islands like New Guinea, Philippines, and Okinawa, and then was in the outfit that landed in Japan by air for the in, before the peace was signed. So I had a 
pretty nice trip through the tropics there, and uh, I didn't get to enjoy any of the mud that Dodge did, and some of them in Europe they'd had so much fun with it. I didn't get to see the Riviera, <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> But I'm always contented that if you, if you look around hard enough, you're always going to find that somebody had it a little easier than you and somebody had it a little harder than you. But and like, like I've said many times before, it's, uh, the military is, is like one big machine and every part's got to do its job or it doesn't work properly. That's right. You know, it takes more than just the infantrymen out there in the field. It takes the people in the background to make sure he gets his beans and his bullets and, and everything that he needs and gets his mail. So. Every job that's done by anybody in the military is an important job. Well, Leon spent a lot of his overtime, overseas time in the 29th Infantry Division, and I believe that they took the toughest casualties of any unit in the Army. So it wasn't all mud with him. I remember when he joined the VFW not too long ago, and, I, and he submitted his DD-214, and I got to looking at that thing, and I thought, I just thought he was a fire chief. I had no idea he'd been through so many uh, major battles in World War II. So he's he's been going strong his whole life, hasn't he? You wouldn't believe it. Look at him, would you? Well, no, I'm not going to. I respect all three of you. If you guys want to get that, I, that's okay with me. Leon, you were the one that, that pretty much kicked off the idea for the World War II monument here at Paducah. Can you tell us how that all came about? Well, Pat Kerr and I was at Chino Drugstore eating lunch. And uh, Hardy Gentry came in and sat down by me. And I said, Hardy, when were we going to build a World War II memorial for the veterans? I said, that one out on, on West Jefferson is a little bit of a disgrace to the World War II veterans. I said, nobody knows where it's at. And it's, it's unsightly, really. So he said, uh, we will do it now if you had it up. And I turned around to Pat Kern and said, Pat, will you be the architect on this and not charge us? And he said, sure. So uh, I turned back around to Hardy and I said, "It's I'll do it. And I got a whole Channel 6 and uh, they did a little story on it and I got a whole the newspaper and they did a story on it. And it, it was one of the easiest things I've ever did. They've taken up money. Uh, now the good old boys helped. They had a fundraiser, and the city gave us some money, and the county gave us money. So, uh, and uh, we had a guy out of Louisville to give us a five thousand dollar check. So we had we had good luck, and we had some guys that gave us five hundred dollar checks. One of them sitting by me now. So. So the fundraising really wasn't uh, no, I, wasn't much of an issue. You you were able to do that uh, pretty easily then. Yeah, huh? that's great. Well, with the way the World War II, ever since the movie Private Ryan came out, you, the World War II vets are getting the respect that they that they deserve, and it's it's kind of reinforced because. The, Tom Hanks was able to put on the screen what, what it was like to be in that type of situation. And you hear about it, but the more interest is generated by it and you see what these uh, what you gentlemen went through, it's uh, uh, that's why you're called the greatest generation. Uh, now, Russ, he said something about uh, you know the fundraising. You all, did a, uh, you all did something to raise money we for that. A, Why don't you tell us about that? Well, we had a wild game cookout at the American Legion soon after that. And... It all came out real well. That's about all I can say about it. We, it's not the first time we've done that, but this was, this was a cause that we never had thought about before. But it's been, uh, there have been several people talked about a World War II memorial ever since World War II, and nothing ever got off the ground. And so what these guys did there in a couple of minutes at lunch one day turned out to be one of the most important things of the century, as far as I'm concerned. It, it, it's amazing how the, uh, you know, just something sitting like that over lunch or coffee can lead to something like that, mm -hmm. and it's just an idea, and it, and it starts snowballing, and 
And with Leon behind it, uh, you know, I knew it was going to be successful when he contacted yeah. us at the VFW. I know that most of the projects were done through the uh, through the American Legion and, and Hardy Gentry because he was one of the original like, fellows in with you guys. And and I just we stayed in the background. I said, if there's anything the VFW can do, let us know. I mean, we made financial donations. I we pushed for the bricks that we'll talk about here in a few minutes, but. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm amazed that it, that it came along as quickly and, and went as well as it did. Well, you say, did a good job, too, Larry. Well, I, did not, I didn't mean it that way. I just I thought it was great the way everybody got together to make sure that we got a really nice World War II monument. Because I, I had seen the one out on West Jefferson that you mentioned earlier. And, and I don't, you're right, I don't think very many people knew it was out there. And, and World War II vets certainly deserve a lot more, more of, a, of a monument than that. Now, Mr. Rose, how... How about this fella here? Apparently, uh, we were talking before the program. Did he just call you up and say, "Hey, you're going to have to help me out here," or have you you known Leon for a long time? As yes. I understand, he just put the hand on me and said, "Hey, give me some money," and I did. And it's just as simple as that, huh? <laughs> you know, uh, in basic training, uh, one of the things I remember the most is. The fact that you'd get these 18-year-olds reporting in, they'd be sort of pimply-faced and pudgy. And after about uh, three weeks, the fat was gone. And after about three more weeks, they'd replaced it with muscle. Somewhere along about week six or eight, they had become hardened. And then the pimples had disappeared. And they looked good, and their faces were brown. Uh, of course, you still had some problems. I particularly remember one night about sundown, every barracks had a sort of a coal bin around the side and the rear. And I remember going out there one night, and here was a, a new recruit, and he was crying his heart out. He was homesick. There's no way to handle that. But anyway, it's amazing how you can take these young men and after eight or ten weeks, you've made men out of them. And it's, it's rather a heartening sort of a thing. It's got to feel rewarding. Now, you've got a picture of, uh, of one of your, is that one of your basic training? Yeah, this is. Can, if they can maybe zoom in and get a uh, One of my companies of in a regimental parade. And where was that taken at? Fort Lewis, Washington. Fort Lewis, Washington. Now, is and that where you spent all of your cycles? No, I was both. Uh, I started out at Fort Lee, then to Fort Devens, which was terrible, snowed all the time. Oh. And then out to Fort Lewis. Um, but you took those young guys and turned them into soldiers. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I bet on graduation day they didn't look anything at all like they were when they came in there, like you say, fat and pimple faced. That's right. That they were, they were, and I remember you talking to the story you just told about being homesick. I think that's one of the toughest things I had to deal with in basic training because I had never been away from home, and I was, you know, eight, nineteen, and young, and it's first time I'd been away from my family, and that was one of the toughest things. I wanted to go home. Did you ever go out to the coal bin? Then they, uh, well, I, I didn't even bother coal bin. I just bury my head in the pillow at night and cry like a baby. But I knew two or three other guys were doing that too, so I didn't feel quite so bad. But you did what everybody else did, and as time progressed, you, it did. It turned you into a man. Now, I lucked out. I, I did go to Europe. It was the Korean War came on, and I was recalled first out of the box. And I thought, man, but they sent me over to Germany. <laughs> That's paradise over there. Yes, it was. I know fellows that go to Germany are still pretty happy about it. <laughs> Leon, Leon, tell us, who, how did they design for the World War II monument to come up? Did you all get together and brainstorm on that, or did Pat do that on his own, or how, how did that come about? Well, we did that while we were eating lunch. Pat said, have you got any ideas? And I said, no. And I asked Hardy if he did, and Hardy said, no. So Pat said, I do. And he came up with this idea uh, of the World War II Memorial. No, it is At the World Globe with the Roman numeral two. And we haven't got the plaque on this yet, but we will get it on before the uh, dedication. Okay. And who's, who's the young lady in there? 
in the picture. Well, that's my beautiful granddaughter. She is a lovely young lady. So that's not part of the memorial. She's just standing there to make it even yeah. prettier. Okay. <laughs> I, I was going to say, if people go down there and they don't find the girl, they're liable to call the police and say, hey, somebody's been messing with the World War II monument. Yeah. Heck, uh, see her. They won't even see the memorial. I was going to say, she's a lovely young lady. You're, you're a blessed man well, to have, you. have a young lady like that in your family. So you guys just are sitting at the table, scribbled out the design, and then Pat came up with, the, with, the, uh, with that. And well, Pat went back to the office and called. Uh, in a couple of days, and said, come back, and Hardy and I went over there. And, of course, when he showed it to us, we both liked it. And uh, we said, go with it. And, and away it went. And away we went. That's great. Now, what was, what was the budget on the, on the thing? Like I say, you, you said the fundraising was fairly easy and, and uh, you well, accomplished Well, we started that. out, we thought we were going to spend around 20000 on it. But then uh, we spent about 31000 already with a lot of work donated. Like Pat's work was donated and we had a contractor donate to, to labor to install the, the memorial. And a guy uh, donated his labor to do the wiring. And a guy's going to donate the, la the labor on the uh, plaque. So we've had a lot of people involved in this. And then everybody pulled together to get this, uh, get yeah. this accomplished. Well, I've seen it. I've, I've driven by there, and it, it is beautiful. It's beautiful. And. Uh, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about the uh, the dedication when uh, when that's planned and uh... well we got the dedication planned for the night after the parade and uh, I thought he's at one o'clock but Ted said he's going to be at two said he talked to Hardy so it will be at two o'clock mm. and that's going to be November the ninth November the ninth the day of the Veterans Day parade yeah okay uh, the Veterans Day's on the Sunday, so we moved it up to Friday. Okay. After the parade. So we'll we'll have the the dignitaries there and the speeches and right. we'll dedicate it. Now you talked about the plaque that was going to be going on the front of it. Have they? Uh, I know that at one time they were wanting to try and get some ideas from some of the younger people in town. Yeah. Uh, have, have, how's that project going? Well, we didn't never get that going. Okay. So uh, uh, Mike White. It, Hoffman signs uh, come up with an idea, and we looked it over and said, "Okay." Now, will that will that be installed by uh, by yes. the dedication? Will yes. it? Okay. And all the insignias of the of the uh, veterans. I mean, of the branches uh, of the branches of service. Oh, yes. that's gonna be that'll be great. That'll be great. Uh, now, you fellas, did, 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 had you thought any time in the past about, uh, I, as I understand, a lot of the World War II vets have talked for years about, you know, there needs to be a World War II monument, and it just, it just never seemed to get off the ground. I remember when, when I was the chairman of the uh, Veterans Memorial that's there on the courthouse lawn, uh, I was at that time the commander of the American Legion in about 89 or 90, and the idea came up that it would, as a World War II, it started as a World War II memorial, actually. But then we had some of the Korean vets that were saying, well, then we need to get done with this and build another one. And, and uh, at that time, you know, we, everybody was like, well, no, wait a minute. How many are we going to build and where are we going to build them? And the committee kind of changed its focus to where that included all veterans. So that takes care of everybody who's ever served in the military. But again, it started as a World War II monument. It didn't end up that way. So. It was long overdue, you know, the, by the time you picked it up and took off with it. And I'm amazed at how quickly you were able to do it just after, you know, the idea coming up while you're sitting around with lunch. But Hardy Gentry's been, you know, very active. I believe he was picked as Legionnaire of the Year this year yeah, at, their, at their state convention, which is, that's quite an honor for somebody from Paducah, Kentucky, to be determined to be the most distinguished Legionnaire in the whole state of Kentucky. That's... Uh, that's going someplace. I, I'm, Hardy couldn't be here today because of previous commitments, but uh, I know he does a lot with the baseball program. He's uh, he's right on top of veterans affairs, and you know that's why when you said it to him, his response I'm not surprised was, "Well, let's start. Let's do it now." Yeah. He's not a procrastinator. He he jumps in there and gets his hands dirty and does the job and does what needs to be done. All right now. 
um, who, who all are you going to have at the dedication? Have you got uh, any any special dignitaries or? Well, we tried to get Ed Whitfield here, but we haven't heard back from him. Mm -hmm. So we've got all the city officials, the county officials, and uh, Robert Coleman's going to speak. He is only a veteran on the city council. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if there's any veterans on the county commission or not. Uh, really, I'm not. I'm not familiar. Couldn't. I don't think there is, but I don't know for sure. But uh, so anyway, that that's going to be be a yeah. good day, good dedication. Will and uh, we want to invite everybody to the dedication. So that we're hoping that the city of all the people yeah. in Paducah, all the people around the area, especially World War II veterans, yeah. will come out and and, and see their. And after monument. that, we can either go to the American Legion Eat or the VFW. Yeah. Uh, whatever, if you like beans, I think you go to the American Legion. <laughs> I think I think the VFWs having barbecue. They sometimes have a fish fry. I think they settled on barbecue. But you'll find something to eat. Like yeah. I say, all the veterans organizations love to celebrate, like I call our day. You know, yeah. this is our time to enjoy ourselves and have a good time. Now, can you tell us, I know the fundraising, you, you, you've accomplished what you need, but you're going to have a maintenance fund for it. Tell us about the bricks, the, the project with the bricks. We've got about, I think, 56 bricks ready to go down. We bought 100 bricks, and when you take one up, you got to put another one down. So uh, we've, got, we've got about, I'd say, 300 left to sell. If anybody's interested in a brick, it's $50. Uh, then we got to send it to uh, Marion Alloys and ha have it engraved. So they are nice, and and uh, they can call either the, the American Legion, VFW, and our me, and we'll see that they get a brick. And they can have inscribed on there the, the yeah the date they were in the service and uh, their name and and it, it, it's going to be nice. Now is this just for World War II veterans or can any veteran buy a brick? Any any veteran can buy a brick. Oh okay. So we, it, we decided that it probably it'd be harder to sell all the brick for just World War II veterans. Or if a family member has a deceased World War II veteran, they could always buy it yes. in his honor and yes. have it and put there away. So you're open. Uh, that's open to um, we, a lot we of people. We've quite a few already. Well, and, and that's oh. still ongoing. They can still right. they can still obtain those. Do you yeah. know? Is is there a cutoff date that you've determined yet, or you? No, I don't think we have a cutoff date. You know, if you uh, say five years from now, somebody wants to say, well, my dad was in. Or my uncle or my grandfather was in World War Two and was killed. Sure, we got, we got bricks left. So. so that's something a family member could do for a, either their the veteran father or relative while they're still alive. Right. And in fact, that would preferably be the time to do it so they would have a chance yeah. to see it. Because I I know that we're losing yeah. World War Two veterans at, at quite a pace. Yeah, we're losing them at something like a thousand a day. Is it up, is that what it's up to now? All right, and so. <laughs> It can't come too fast for some of us. Yeah. That, that make you, you think that maybe that's why the good Lord decided to let this project get think, done so think, quick and so you guys can get a chance to see it? I think we had a little help from him, but really. Uh, it but, it, it uh, is long overdue, and it, and it is beautiful. Mm. And I know you've worked uh, you know, you've worked hard and come by the post and talked to me a couple of times about things that you were going to do. And he was kind of the liaison between between me and you because you were so busy that I could, I'd always call you at home in the evening. I'd be, so Leon, I hate to bother you, but I want to clarify something here. And uh, You did just an outstanding job. And then when you tell me how simple it was, that's... It was easy. Well, well you know, with friends like Russ and Alan here, it's got to be easy, you know. So that's the thing about World War II vets that I really admire is the way you guys stick together. And you may have differences between yourselves, but you know deep down inside that you, you really love each other. Uh, we're getting down to the end of the program here. It's just going about another two or three minutes. I want to make sure we don't forget anything. Is there anything, Leon, that I haven't touched on or anything you want to share with the audience before we, before we finish up here? Well, other than just invite everybody out to the uh, memorial dedication uh, and... Uh, 
by the bricks. Good idea. Helen, is there anything she want to get out and say before we get closed up here? One of the most interesting things in basic training was the final march, the 15 mile march that you had to do in four hours, complete with a 10 minute break in between each hour. And uh, of course you had a lot of stragglers, but that meant that they would finally catch up about the time the break was over. <laughs> But that was the test, 15 miles, four hours. And did, did most all of them make it? Yes. That's great, that's great. Russ, how about you? You got any things you want to make sure you get out before we get, uh, before we get well, signed off here? I think you ought to have Leon tell us about the Battle of the Riviera that he... <laughs> the Battle of the Riviera? Yeah. <laughs> there's, I got a feeling there's an inside joke going on there, and I'm almost afraid to delve into it. I did help, play, uh, help liberate Paris, France. Too. Did you? Yes, I did. And I would imagine they were quite glad to see you. Oh, yes. But after the war, I stayed in, I stayed in Germany seven months after the war was over in the MPF and, and did go to the Riviera for a week and I enjoyed it. Well then, you've been working hard and fighting hard. You deserved a little bit of a break there, didn't you? <clears throat> and I won't, well, I, won't, I won't quiz you about what kind of a battle you might have gotten into on the Riviera because that could lead us in some very oh, dangerous he, territory. He, 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 dangerous territory. He, 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 he still bears the scars. Okay, now I got to get you guys over at the V sometime so you can share this story with me because I got a feeling we can't put this one on the air. No, it's not but it's, really. It's, I got to hear it now. You got my, you got my curiosity up. I've got to know what's going on. But. Uh, Hopefully we'll have a good turnout. The weather will be good. Uh, I, I presume that you all you all will participate in the Veterans Day parade earlier that yeah, day. Yes. So and then we'll go to the different veterans service organizations and eat. And we're just as I mentioned earlier to the people that were on the uh, uh, parade committee, we can just make a whole weekend out of this since it starts on yeah. Friday and then there's a musical thing on on Saturday night and Sunday being the true Veterans Day. We'll just take and make a three day event out of it. And, uh, you know, hopefully you'll be able to get out with some more of your comrades and guys that you met in World War II and swap a couple of stories because I, I know that's my favorite part of Veterans Day. I mean, I enjoy the eating, too, of course, but I always enjoy getting out and swapping stories with some guys. And, uh, you know, that's what Veterans Day is all about. On Memorial Day, we take care of those who, who gave their lives, you know, and I know that you fellows, I'm sure, lost buddies. There are people that you knew. And on, vet on Memorial Day, that's, that's what we do is we take the time to remember them. Uh, but Veterans Day is, uh, as we've said before, that's for us. That's for those of us who have fought and served our country and, and, and are still surviving. And it always amazed me that uh, on, on Veterans Day, most veterans don't get off. You know, but certain places are closed, but the most, normally when I got off on Veterans Day, I had to use a vacation day. But uh, that's just what it is. And, you know, we, we'll get together and enjoy ourselves. You fellas know you're invited over to the VFW anytime you want to. Well, I'll see you over at the Legion if I don't see you there. But thanks for coming on the program today. I want to thank all of you for tuning in today. And we'll see you next time on Veteran Voice.